flame seemed to add that element of excitement to many celebratory occasions. Your cat's birthday, New Year's celebrations, or your end of school year bonfire. And isn't it so much better when the flames can be any colour you want? At the very least, our ancestors seemed to agree, then got the bright idea to launch those flaming multicoloured cannonballs into the air, which is how we got fireworks. But just how can these flaming death traps come in so many different colours anyway? To find out, let's go back to the basics. Flame tests. To begin with, what even is a flame test? Why do we do flame tests anyway? Apart from the burning desire to pass your chemistry GCSE, flame tests are, well, tests that use flames to identify metal ions through the colour of the flame produced. By ions, we mean specific parts of ionic compounds, which have an individual electrostatic charge. Metals tend to make positive ions, aka cations. To carry out a flame test, you'd need a loop of platinum or nichrome wire, dilute hydrochloric acid, the solid you would like to test, a Bunsen burner, and a flame would be good. Dip the loop of wire into the hydrochloric acid, better known as stomach acid and hopefully not taken from anyone's stomach and put it into the blue flame so the air hole of the Bunsen burner is fully open. Repeat this step until no colour can be seen in the flames, ensuring no contaminating ions are present on the wire to begin with. Wouldn't want to mistake contaminated copper for arsenic. That was an interesting day. Then dip the wire into the hydrochloric acid, and then the solid you want to test. Now you're good to put the wire in the flame and see your five seconds of beautifully coloured flame. Yes, it's a big moment but stay humble, keep your goggles on, and observe the colour. The important colours to remember for your GCSEs are red for lithium, orange red for calcium, yellow for sodium, green for barium, blue green for copper, and lilac for potassium. That's the colours in a rainbowish order, and you can remember the elements with the incredibly memorable mnemonic, lively cat's name barking curious coot. Now that we know how to carry out a flame test, what causes the colours that we see? No, it's not the ions desperately crying out for attention with a new look. It's just the electrons on a sugar high. Well, not on sugar, and not exactly high. But you know what we mean. When electrons are part of an atom, they exist in electron shells. Or if you're an A-leveler who's just realised that everything they've been taught is a lie, orbitals. But forget about orbitals, they're not important right now. Anyways, now that we've clarified that energy levels are basically electron shells, have you ever wondered why they're always filled up starting with the ones nearest to the nucleus? That's because electrons are always trying to exist in the state with the least energy possible. Ground state. What does this have to do with the electron shells filling up from the nucleus? I hear you ask. It's really quite simple. The protons in the nucleus have a positive charge, meaning they attract the negatively charged electrons, and the less energy the electrons have, the less able they are to escape the attraction, being pulled closer and closer to the nucleus. It's kind of like trying to escape glue. If you don't have enough energy, you might just resign yourself to leaving that paintbrush stuck to your hand. This means that the energy level the electron lies at depends on how much energy it has. The more energy, the higher the energy level. Now, depending on the type of person you are, ground state could arguably resemble you in the morning, lying in bed and dreaming of breakfast, the state in which you have the least amount of energy possible. But now imagine that you found that pack of sugar-coated diabetes in a packet gummies under your pillow and devoured it in seconds. Full hyperactive mode has been activated and you're jumping on the bed. This is essentially what happens in flame tests. An electron gets an energy boost, in this case from the thermal energy of the flame, and gets excited. Now that our electron has more energy, it can resist the electrostatic attraction of the protons in the nucleus, and quite literally jumps from its current energy level to a higher one. The reason for this jump is because the energy levels are discrete, meaning distinct, separate, or distinctly separate. In terms of energy levels, this means that an electron can exist on one energy level or another, but never in between. This change from one discrete state to another without any transition in between is called a quantum jump, or a quantum leap, and in the case of electrons, it's called excitation. 
Yes, really. All in all, it doesn't sound too bad, right? In reality, excitation is a tad more complicated than this. The electron only performs a quantum leap if enough energy is provided, and if there's not enough energy, it'll pass right through, just like light passing through glass. But then, there are some elements which don't exactly care about this, and then there's excitation of already excited electrons and quantum numbers. If you want to learn about excitation in more detail, we can safely say that this isn't the video for you. Good thing there's no need to know about that yet. As we've mentioned earlier, electrons are always trying to lose energy and return to ground state. This means that once the electron has performed its quantum leap up the energy levels, it loses its energy, jumping back down. This is called relaxation or de-excitation. This energy is lost as a wave of electromagnetic radiation, better known as a photon. If we were continuing with our metaphor, this would be the point at which the sugar's worn off, and an emergency crash landing manoeuvre is performed. You could say that this metaphor is overextending a bit, but it's good for one more thing. Now, depending on how high you've managed to jump, the degree of damage to your bed, and perhaps more importantly yourself, when the crash landing manoeuvre is performed will vary. If you had enough energy to reach the ceiling, you may crash so hard that you'd be left with a bruise just as purple as the light produced when the electrons emit a lot of energy. I mean, in addition to completely destroying the bed, but that's beside the point. If you are so tired that the peak of the sugar high was just a little hop, well, you may go as red with embarrassment as the flame observed when the electrons emit a smaller amount of energy. To be more specific, replace the height reached with the amount of energy and the degree of damage with the wavelength and frequency. The more energy, the greater the frequency, the shorter the wavelength and the purpler the colour. And vice versa. Now, if you're confused as to how energy affects the colour, let's dive into GCSE physics for a bit. Firstly, energy increases the frequency of the wave. Light is a transverse wave, by the way. It's the one that doesn't look like a barcode in diagrams. If this doesn't make sense, imagine trying to say a tongue twister as many times as you can in a minute, with the number of times you can say it as the frequency, and the time you take to say each one as the wavelength. The more energy you have, the more times you can say it. The less energy, the more likely you are to tell the person to go away. So then, the more energy, the higher the frequency. But then, if you can say it more times per minute, you're probably making it sound more like gibberish, because you're taking less time to say it each time. In other words, the higher the frequency, the shorter the wavelength. Now, looking at this table of colours, we can see that each colour has a different wavelength and frequency, with red on the end with the longer wavelengths, and purple on the end with the higher frequency. This means that changing either the wavelength or the frequency will also change the colour. And wavelengths and frequencies are decided by the amount of energy emitted, which is how energy affects the colour of the flames. You might still be wondering how different elements cause different flame colours. Well, that's because different elements require different amounts of energy for excitation. This is because different elements have different numbers of protons, meaning that some elements such as potassium may have stronger electromagnetic forces of attraction and therefore need more energy for excitation, while elements such as lithium have weaker electromagnetic forces of attraction and don't need as much energy. Of course, this also means during relaxation that heavier elements with more protons would emit more energy, which is why potassium has a lilac flame and lithium has a red one. If this whole spiel is getting you more lost than you were before, then maybe it would be better to look at a summary of what electrons actually do. Electrons want to lose energy, and are usually in the state where the least amount of energy is needed, called ground state. When electrons absorb energy, the amount of which differs for each element, they get excited and perform a quantum leap to a higher energy level. When they return to their ground state, they emit this energy in the form of light waves, or photons, because they don't need it anymore. Depending on the amount of energy, the colours of the photons will vary, and this is what form the cool flames we see. Okay now, enough about excitation. This isn't a physics crash course. Let's get on to the bit you've all been waiting for. The explosive luminous chemical compounds generally containing cations relating to metals depending on their respective luminous indicators with an absence of colour for a background. Yes, yes. I mean fireworks. So we've already covered that flame test show us cool colours, right? You can also see these colours with fireworks. Fireworks tend to include metallic compounds, with metals chosen for the colours they produce in flame tests. 
Now for our grand finale, we'll give you a virtual fireworks show. So sit back and relax to these bursts of light while we aggressively shout out the compounds that are used to make them. Strontium, in the form of strontium nitrate, carbonate or sulfate. Calcium, with calcium carbonate, chloride or sulfate. Sodium, starring cryolite or sodium carbonate or sulfate. Barium, featuring barium nitrate, carbonate, chloride or chlorate. Copper, taking the form of copper chloride, carbonate or oxide. Hope you were listening, because this one combines copper and strontium. It's a fusion firework. This regal colour is sponsored by white hot magnesium and aluminium. Keeping it plain and simple, you'll get this by burning magnesium, aluminium or titanium. Hope you enjoyed learning about fire, folks. Whether you wanted to find your favourite colour in flames or just a pyromaniac, you now know the science behind it whether you like it or not.